Hello everyone, it's Derek Floyd here, Beautiful Now Podcast. Welcome to another edition of Chasing the Impossible. This is the segment where I interview special guests who happen to have accomplished impossible things along the way to let you know no matter what dream you're chasing, no matter what obstacle seems impossible to you, if they can reach their impossible, you can reach yours too. And if you enjoy this kind of content, do me a favor, pause right now before you go any further and hit me with a like or subscribe to the channel. This lets me get the most updated content to you as soon as it's available. And as always, most important to me, most dear to my heart, if you enjoy this kind of content, share it with a friend. Let someone else know it's okay to be uplifted, encouraged, and inspired. Now, today's special guest is a dear friend of mine that I've met along the way who you're going to find out is just a super amazing human being. Not only that, but he's a Grammy Award winner twice, <laughs> and he's been the first of many as far as, as a songwriter, producer, composer, arranger. This man has done a little bit of everything, and he's only 36 years old. So I feel like I'm a little old now. i got to catch up, right? <laughs> so if you've got a moment, please give you a warm welcome to my good friend, Mr. Tony Sukar. Tony, are you there, brother? Talk to me. I am here. Thank you so much for this incredible opportunity to speak to you and to your, you know, your community. I love this, uh, the whole subject, you know, chasing the impossible. Um, I've always uh, tried to see uh, life as um, a bunch of obstacles, you know, you got to jump over <laughs> to reach, you know, those dreams, man, which we could do. seem impossible many times, but really nothing is impossible, man. You can, hey, we talked about it together, it nothing's impossible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, man, I'm so glad you just took a few minutes to stop by. I know you're crazy busy. You got a new baby in the house. You got records you're working on. You're trying to do so many things. So I understand. Stopping by, taking a few minutes means a lot to us. We appreciate it. No, no, it's a pleasure, really, you know, to to be here with you and um, uh, share a little bit about my story. And uh, if I can inspire other people, that's uh, – it's really – probably one of the most important things in my life is to be able to motivate and inspire people and make them feel good. You know, that's why we are musicians and artists and mm. we take that responsibility, right? I mean, it's, it's a true. responsibility. It's true. And it's, true. It, it's part of my, it's part of my job to, to do that. And, mm. um, I always be honest. That's the main thing, you know, <laughs> and I'm still learning. I mean, yeah. I don't really know, you know, I'm not close to knowing at all. I just, <laughs> at 36, know, man, man, you got a long way to go, bro. <laughs> lot, 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 man. I'm You're still, a, I got kids your age, homie. It, <laughs> that's wild. <laughs> I mean, you look really young, bro. I'm telling you, you look super young. I'll so, take that. I'll roll with that. <laughs> I'll let you have that compliment. <laughs> No, so no, I've got no, some notes awesome. because there's mm -hmm. so much to cover with you. I'm going to take a quick jot and take a look. It's at 36, like I said, you've worn so many hats in the industry right now, from artist to producer to composer to arranger. Is there one thing that still stands out as your first original passion? Um, you know, really, my original passion was uh, soccer, to play soccer. I love sports. I love that was my I wanted to be a professional soccer player. That was really my my true passion. Uh, then music happened to be, you know, how everybody has like a fallback, you know, like in case something <laughs> work out. your fallback. Music, huh? Yeah, music was kind of like the fallback. It was like, oh, whatever, you know, I got I, I can't make it in soccer. So and, you know, it was tough. It was a, it was a difficult moment in my life. It was pretty depressing not yeah. like because I, I i played competitively for all of my life man wow. since i was you know since i was six years old i started playing soccer and traveling teams and um you know my high school we were national champions you know and wow we were like the best you know no, and so wow. everybody, everybody went off to college to play soccer and I didn't want to like leave Miami because you know I'm a Latino boy, so I had to stay with mom. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So I was like, gosh, like. And then in I guess by my by my house, I didn't really have many um, options, you know. And so the college that I went to, according to my grades, because my grade, my academic 
um, high school grades weren't so good, my GPA or whatever, the school that I went to, the soccer program was, was just different, you know? I, I didn't really feel it. And so that's when I decided to study music. And I got a scholarship for music, which was cool. I wasn't expecting that, but um, I guess they saw the talent in me, you know? And then since I, I left music then, I, I sort of took all that uh, discipline and that style, you know, of life, of, of playing soccer and, you know, being the, the most competitive person on the team. I, I just did it in the ensemble, right? Mm. So I was like the most competitive person. I just wanted to be the best. So I saw an opportunity as a drummer to be different. And mm. that was to be a, a writer, you know, to write songs and to produce music and write arrangements and orchestrate because I knew that if I did that I would have the upper hand because you know drummers weren't thinking like that they were just thinking about paradiddles and all this stuff mm. rudiments mm -hmm. so if you talk to me about passion it's like um, definitely soccer but then once music came in uh, writing to me has been my passion mm. Uh, mm. it's the thing that I really love to do the most Wow. Wow. So but it does take you the longest. It, so, yeah, music long... and writing is difficult. Yeah. It takes a little yeah. bit of time. <laughs> it does. It drains it's... you, man. Drains you. Yeah. It's a whole other skill set. Completely different. Completely yes. different. Um, knowing that writing and, and maybe music was the second passion, which is unique. You know, who knew that you've done such a great things in music as what we see? It had to be your first passion, but it wasn't. It was athletics. It was soccer. And, you know, my, my wife always says, and she just said a little bit ago on the, on the text there, when one door closes, another one always opens. God always opens a window. We were just watching this in, a, <laughs> in a, my, one of my favorite movies, Sound of Music. When God closes a door, he always opens a window. That's what happened with you. He closed the door with soccer, but opened the window to music. And, man, that was your ticket to where God wanted you to be, which is pretty awesome. Um, taking that direction, I understand you played drums when you were 13, right? So... Who handed you the sticks to tell you you wanted to play drums? And how'd that feel when you first got started? Right. Well, that that's the cool part is that I um, I was born into a family of musicians. My dad is an incredible pianist, self-taught. You know, he learned to play the accordion because, you know, he, he had a tough childhood, you know, uh, from at the age of four, his parents got divorced and between the age of four and 11, he kind of lived like a bohemian life where he would just live in like uncle's house and stuff like that. And that's when he picked up an accordion that his cousin gave him because he was so poor that he couldn't afford any toys or anything. So he, that was, his, and he figured out how to play the accordion on his own. And then uh, he just like, he has this ear. Be, and so um, he started a band when he got to Miami, he immigrated to the United States and my mom, uh, she was always a singer in Peru too, like not a professional singer, but she would, you know, sing in the house parties and stuff and to make ends meet in, in Miami. Like when they came here, they had to start a band to start playing for tips, like on the street. Actually, it started as a duo and then they created a, like a wedding band, you know, to play in like private parties and stuff. Mm. Really cool, like story, because when I was old enough, and I learned how to play the instruments because my dad would teach me like the drums. He put me on the gig, you know, because it was going to be more money for the house, you know. Wow. And um, and so then uh, my sister also sang in the band. She sang backgrounds and she would sing some leads. And uh, my brother also then joined the band. He was younger than me and he played percussion as well. And he was a DJ and he would DJ and the band breaks. So the family band was the way to make ends meet, man. Like it was part of our it was like our our job, you know, mm. like your house chores, you know, it was like, and so my friends would go on the weekends, they would go out, you know, and go to the movies and, and I could never go, you know, mm. I, I was always at the gigs, you know, wow. and we were working like three, four in the morning, you know, and because, you know, the, the gig life, people think that sometimes it's easy, but it's not like, bro, you and I would leave my house like two, three in the afternoon and get mm. back like four or five in the morning because you had to carry all the gear, connect the cables, you know, do the mixer. Mm. Sometimes we were playing these like mansions that you had to carry like speakers, literally like <gasps> oh, an entire football field, bro, oh. on grass, bro, you know? <laughs> so that was, that was my childhood, man. Uh, that was literally like since I was 13 years old, like 
that was it, you know, until I was 17, 18, and I finally went to college. But um, it's, that's what, you know, gave me the street too, you know, like Mm. street smart and how to like value, you know, money and how to value um, the, the, how to value your parents and, mm. and see them, you know, fighting for you, you know, yeah. and giving you all that. And so now, like, I'm a Grammy winner and everything, but um, to me, those moments are like the best moments, you know, because uh, I, every time I want to quit, like, every time I feel like I got to give up mm-hmm. because I'm just so fed up with something mm-hmm. and it happens in this industry like crazy, mm-hmm. I think of my parents, you know, at those gigs. <sighs> You know what I mean? Mm. And I'm like, hey, you know, it's like amazing. You know, that's, mm. it's really inspiring. That's good stuff, man. I mean, you, you've got some strength. Uh, I'm reading a book right now. Just started it uh, by a, a, a prominent uh, pastor called Michael Todd. And the name of the book is called Crazy Faith. And he talks about you have to have a foundation, a structure to build upon to make your life better than what it is. And if, you're, if your foundation is weak, your life will topple left or right, right? But your foundation was so strong with your family that you guys had a core to believe in with each other. That makes such a huge difference. That's what brought you to your dedication, your, 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 man, your focus is all coming from that space. What an amazing part of that story. And you couldn't have been where you are minus that part of the story, don't you think? Oh, guaranteed, man. Like, you know, I don't really know. I didn't notice it until now that I'm a dad. You know what I mean? Yeah. 36 years had to pass for me to finally understand who I am. Mm. I didn't really know who I was, you know, like I would look at myself in the mirror and I was just a working machine and I was, you know, my values were always straight, but I, and I would always always question myself, like, am I just the person that I created myself? Like, am I like, did I make truly like these decisions out of the blue or, or was I sort of almost programmed by the (laughs) dna of who my parents are truly are and my ancestors you know and it's like Mm. it truly is like and the the core family values are so important man like you don't understand like if it wasn't for my parents with that how much they sacrificed for us and how they were able to stay together with that bond you know Mm. and always know that love will prevail Mm that they didn't ever tell me anything. It was just a matter of seeing it, you know, Mm. but it was normal to me. And now it's like, whenever I feel like those moments, like, man, I'm like, what my parents had to go through was way worse than what I have to go through, (laughs) you know, like, and they did it. So it's like, suck it up, you know, God is here. God is, God does not gonna throw you something that you cannot handle, you know, this is all part of life. And just move forward because now my parents are like living the dream really because mm-hmm. now it's incredible how what had happened my mom is like her career exploded at 62 years old you know she's a star in peru wow my dad is like you know chill he's getting his phd now like he's doing <laughs> wow. a doctorate he's a philosopher oh you my know? gosh man my sister went to harvard you know no I mean? way like, <laughs> that's you know, awesome like crazy yeah that is so awesome, man. That that just blesses my heart. Blesses my heart. It just thank you, thank you. Everybody out there watching, hard work, dedication, foundation. You hearing it, faith. You hearing it. You hearing it. Faith in your family. I'll come back around to that in just a second, just because there's so much depth in what you're saying. I want to make sure I cover the rest of your story so that I can put it all together. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, you. We talked about you play a bunch of instruments. You don't just play percussion. I mentioned percussion, but you're also a pianist. You play a couple of instruments, and how does that? translate into how you compose and arrange for what you do now yeah well i um you know i've been uh with so many instruments in the household that like piano was such a natural thing because my dad was a pianist and he had pianos in the house he had all sorts of keyboards and so that was the actual the first instrument he taught me how to play um but i quickly went on to the percussion because i wasn't going to take his own gig you know <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? So he was like, hey, here's a drum set. He bought me a drum set, you know? <laughs> and he was like, look, this is how you kind of play. And he taught me like the basics. And I really loved it, man. I just fell in love with the groove, you know? I, I love to groove. Um, so I, I quickly felt a, a passion for drums. But man, the piano was so important because when I got specifically um, to college and I was in high school, like whenever I had to take theory classes, 
it was so great because I could picture the piano in front of my face, you know, like I knew, I knew like everything, the scales and everything, because I can visualize it, right? So the mm -hmm. piano is such an important instrument. And um, that's how I learned how to just make everything easier for me in terms of production as well. Because you know how you can, when you produce, you can program everything with the piano. So I, I have like the hand and chops, you know, I can play all my scales. So I can really play um, high complexity stuff as well on the piano. And um, although I'm not a piano player, like I'm not, that's not what I go by, but I do defend myself on it and I can songwrite and, you know, I, I, I work in Finale, you know, notation software. And, um, I MIDI program all of my arrangements before I, you know, I, so I can listen to them. So that's, uh, that's the sort of the first instrument. And then all the percussion stuff, man, timbales, bongos, congas, and that's because of all of the genres of music that my parents' band had to play, right? So mm. we had to play all sorts of music from, man, like I'm talking about Elvis, the Beatles, to Oscar <laughs> de Leon, El Gran Combo de Puerto Rico, wow. El Arroyo, you know, Juan Gabriel, <laughs> Luis Miguel, Selena, <laughs> dude, like Mexican, you know, all really, because it was just, a, you know, we were like top 40 Latin band, bro. You got to play everything. Oh, man. Yeah. And that takes work to learn all those different genres. That, bro. A, another part of your story that makes you so unique, because we're going to talk about it here in a minute, but that's another way that you created this sound that you were able to translate all these different genres into a Latin salsa style, which no one really done the way you've done it. So it's just blows my mind to hear what you've done now to hear how you did that that was part of your repertoire with your family you had to learn how to do it on the fly right bro it, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't easy man um but i think like yeah it's being in miami is also a great thing Derek, because miami is already a melting pot in itself so yeah um you get to learn and, and mesh with all these different cultures and um being a percussionist is fun because then that's you're kind of like a world music guy like you're <laughs> yeah. you know you you have your rhythms and then you have your style of playing and then they'll be like it's the same instrument the congas that mm -hmm. came from cuba but then the peruvians adapted it to their style mm -hmm. the puerto ricans adapted it to their style and then new york the whole sound kind of changed but it's the same instrument so you guys play the same instrument but you have different vocabulary and you start sharing that vocabulary and you start learning new words. And then mm -hmm. that's how you can, you know, create a new sound. Ah, that's so unique, man. That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, knowing that you had to dive into other different genres, cultures, sounds, uh, artists, what were some of the, or who were some of the musical heroes that you looked up to as you were building your sound? Um, the, the I guess the biggest musical hero for me is Tito Puente. I think Tito was like, for me, the most influential because he was one of those few percussionists that was an arranger and an orchestrator. Most uh, percussionists were just percussionists, you know, they would just play that instrument. So Tito, he went to like Juilliard, you know, and he wrote over 2000 arrangements. And I was like, man, I, he was on a Simpsons episode, you know, he became famous band leader. And I said, I, I, I don't want to be like a backup guy, you know, I just, I want to be my own band lead. I want to have my own band and be like my own person and have a brand. So that was the main guy I would say that was influential for me. But obviously the other great uh, team body players and drummers, um, not only in the Latin side, but like, you know, obviously like Dave Weckl, Dennis Chambers, like all those drummers were crazy influential for me. And then like arrangers like Sergio George, um, Bobby Valentin, Jose Lugo, like there's so many great arrangers. Quincy, Quincy to me is like the all time monster of all monsters, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, he is so, a monster. <laughs> he's a beast, you know? Like, how do you do that? How do you create a, like a legacy like that, right? I mean, um, <laughs> Michael Jackson, you know, like it's just, a, it's so cool. Like I love America and I love Miami for that because I can. I'm a salsa guy, bro. Like I love salsa, <laughs> like Latino. Yes. But I love hip hop. You know, Tupac. I come from listening. That's what I used to listen to in middle school, man. Like Tupac. Like, <laughs> no way. Like, I that can't was see you rocking Tupac in your head. Mate. I actually want to be a rapper. <laughs> no, you know, like, I can't see. Yeah, it. I was like, yo, I want to be a rapper. And yo, my I name is Tony S. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was a terrible, <laughs> terrible rapper. My, 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 oh my God, my writing was horrible. My freestyle was terrible. I mean, you gotta be born with it, you know what I mean? But I like it, you know, I, I vibe with it. Yeah. Well, just because you like it, that means you can do all of it. You, you gotta exactly. leave something. You gotta something. know your limitations. You gotta know yeah, your limitations. You know. That well, would be chasing the impossible. Huh? That, that, that would, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned Michael Jackson, of course, is one of the, the great people that you followed, you admired and respected. And that for those of you who don't know, and you're going to learn today, that he is the founder and a producer of a project called Unity, the Latin tribute to Michael Jackson. It was an event that happened and is still ongoing. You can watch this event uh, from, I think, from your YouTube, from your page, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's actually, um, you know, it's also on demand on PBS. It was... Yeah. Um, live concert special but it was also an album a studio album that i yeah. produced it took me about five years to to put that project together man it was a pretty beast project uh over 100 musicians you know 10 different um award-winning artists that came together it's a you know all michael jackson music with arrangements um latin big band you know real tasteful um I had to get the licensing for it which was a huge mission as well um, but it's that's that's why it's um, it was cleared by the estate, man. You know, and we did a whole TV special on it. Like, it's something that I would say is almost the impossible to do independently. <laughs> but I did it. You know, I mean, I know that a label can do it because they got the contacts, they got everything, they got the money. But I didn't have the contacts, nor the money, nor anything. I just had the idea and the music, right? But that's when you know that music can go a long way. A lot of times without um, our, you know, what God can do for us because of reality, right? You see, mm. reality check, right? I mean, mm. of course, we all have to have, um, we all have to know what the reality is, but that doesn't mean it should limit your dreams. Mm. Mm. And and I'm going to, I'm going to, pull back and pause just where you are because I don't think if those of us who have never seen this project realize he took 14 Michael Jackson songs and then not recomposed them but rearranged them in a different Latin salsa style with all the parts for all the musicians across the stage you have no idea how much it takes to pull that off I mean oh it's a lot man you know it was so much work Derek like man it was I look back to that and I'm like, I can't believe I did that. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was I thinking? You know? Why was it so important for you to do it? You know, I, again, in those moments that I was like, I just can't do this anymore. I would, I would remember my parents, you know, I would remember those gigs. I remember like everything. And I said, I know that this is good. I know that people are going to love this. I know that people are going to enjoy it. I have to do this, you know, so I would continue hammering out those arrangements and continue rehearsing the band and everybody loved everything that i was doing so i knew that it was good but a lot of times like doors would close you know the licensing being one of them I had to really fight man like to get that and lawyers would tell me all the time music lawyers would be like tony man you're not gonna get those licenses you're crazy <laughs> you know it's not gonna happen uh you have no idea how many no's i had to come across that made me feel really bad mm. about myself you know I kind of mm. was like why are they doing this mm. man you know <laughs> I'm gonna sh share with you one anecdote that you're gonna be like I can't believe this I'm listening so um the the song Thriller right uh mm. it's you know that was one of the first songs I did and I remember I I went to my lawyer and I said look you know I want to get the licensing for it. this is the first song right and uh she was like all right let's try it you know it's Three hundred dollars an hour, and I said, "Whatever, you know, like I gotta do it." And I had like literally no money, man. This was like money that I would save from my gigs that I was making like a hundred dollars a gig, you know, it was crazy. So I had to do three gigs to pay her for one hour of work, man. It was crazy. Oh, <laughs> wow. so, so she went to Rod Temperton, you know, um, and Rod, you know, went to the publisher and wrote to no, it's Tony, you know, he's a great kid and everything. It's like straight up, no, you know, like it's just like. Denied. <laughs> it's like I was like, what you, like, is there a reason? Like, uh, like no, nah, it's just that like, he doesn't want to give a license. Period. 
And I was like, why? You know, and then they're like, no. And then he's like, finally, they replied. And it's like, oh, you got to change this. You got to change that. I don't like the, you know, the P section. And I'm like, man, like, what is this? Like, <laughs> so, you know, um, I fast forward, I work on the rest of the album. Um, and then uh, I, I come back to Thriller. Um, and then after I finally showed like the entire album and everything and how everything was, and then they were like, Oh, you know what? You should put back those sections because I want it to be as good as the other songs. And I was like, what? Like, what, is, what is this? You know, like, what's going on here? You know, it's like, you know, so when, they, when people don't know you, when people don't know who you are, or what you're doing, you know, they'll be like difficult, right? Mm -hmm. But as soon as they see like, oh, there's jump on a train and like things are going there, I want to, you know, I, I want to be mm -hmm. a part of that. And it's like, <laughs> you know, it's the same thing that I showed you in the beginning, but. It's just the way life is, you know, you got to keep hammering away just because you get one note doesn't mean you got to accept it. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you got to say, okay, you know what? Cool. But I'm going to keep marching forward because I know eventually I'm going to get that. Yes. Oh, so good. So good. You inspire me today. I, I'm just sitting there. Oh, I'm going to dump a here pretty soon. You're working me. <laughs> um, so as we close that part of the chapter, you know, that other people that are listening, you brought together hundreds of musicians, not like five or 10, like hundreds of musicians to do this yeah. and when it all came together we're talking about you know I, I got a list here John Sakata, Sheila E uh, I mean so many more and it, and it was shown on PBS across 360 stations so if you yeah. was if you would have stopped at the first or second no you wouldn't have had half a million people see that that concert in exactly. one shot yeah and and that's the beauty of it and uh, I kind of feel like in a way spiritually connected to Michael Jackson in a way because I feel like I don't know man it's something surreal like I feel like I close to him without meeting him you know I was able to for example like have a FaceTime with Katherine Jackson his mom like that, that for me was like one of those most special moments of my life you know like mm. where she FaceTimed me and said Tony I you know I congratulate you for the music the excellent music you've done I was like wow like you know, that's the mother of Michael. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> oh, you know? man. Um, I worked with Bruce Wedeen, you know, yeah. like with Michael Jackson's co-producer, one of the best mixing engineers of all time. I was able to sit down with him in his ranch, you know, and mix with him two songs in this album and, mm. and you know, hear all of those anecdotes that he had with Michael and all those stories. And mm. I kind of felt the spirit, right? And mm. those things would have never happened if I would have, like I like you just said, you know, it would have just been like, ah, whatever, it's not going to work. You know, it's like, nah, you got to go forward because you got to believe in yourself. You got to know how to self-motivate mm. too, because sometimes um, people can be cruel, you know, like mm. sometimes people just don't want good things to happen to you. Um, mm. They just, there's people out there that, that really hate it when people have good things happen to them. There's some haters. It's so weird. Like, I don't understand it. I, and I will never understand it because... Mm. Wow. I think it's like a family thing, you know, I just, I think subconsciously and I see it time and time again, like when the family core foundation and those principles are not there in the beginning of your life, you may think that it's not important, but it, it programs you in a way mm. for the rest of your life. You know mm. what I mean? So it's so important for us parents to be responsible enough to understand, um, how your actions are going to affect that person forever you know and that's your legacy you know that is you mm. that is an extension of you like you should always want to be the best you can so that that human can take whatever you've tried to do in your life and make it even better mm. you know what i mean mm. um and i don't know what's going on with the planet bro because i just feel like we're going backwards so many times you know what i yeah. mean yeah. And, and the things that you see these days, even yesterday, you know, July 4th, there was yeah. like mass shooting again. It's like terrible, terrible. You know, friend. and then I, you know, just because I'm um, like, I am that type of person that I like to see what's going on because I, I care about the future of, of the earth, you know, mm -hmm. the world because mm -hmm. of my daughter. I mean, what, what's going on? And it's like, yeah, he, the kid had a very bad problem with his dad, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, lived this like really abused life and it's mm -hmm. like of course you know like i mean you, yeah. you're kind of just writing it for him you know mm -hmm. what's gonna happen and it's just like so sad you know so 
Mm -hmm. I love how uh, you're tying that together. I love that because the foundation is what you're talking about. That really does make the difference of where your life is going to go. You know, hundred percent. Mm. It's the foundation mm. is everything. Mm. So good, so good, so good. So wise for a young man to be speaking at 36. Super wise, bro. No, thanks, man. Uh, no but you know, recently I've been getting enlightened, bro. My God hasn't been enlightening me. I think that those gifts that that's a you know a son or a daughter, you know that that gift right there. Mm is the greatest gift you can ever receive because all of a sudden everything starts making sense you know what <laughs> it i mean does. it it's most like, certainly does wow like you, it you all know, becomes you, clear in perspective like your lens gets clearer per, yeah and you have a purpose you have a mm -hmm. real purpose in life wow so let me close off that last part of that because i know you know, once you got the whole Unity project off the ground and, and after all the no's and you finally pushed through and you, you met Michael's mom and Bruce Whitty, I mean, that's a lot of big mountaintops. Uh, you know, you get to the space and this record was not able to be nominated for a Grammy. You know, you yeah, put all man. this work into it. Like your, it, was the, it was your dream, everything you put into it. Tell me about yeah, that what was... that felt like because you weren't able to accept a Grammy for it. Yeah, you know, and I and I love these moments in life. Um, I mean, obviously, I didn't love it in the moment. You know, I was so pissed. I was like one of the most <laughs> mad individuals of life, right? Um, but I I really love that that happened to me, bro, because um, I was able to to jump that hurdle that was so big. You know, like so. What happens is that I finish this album, right? Uh, five years of work. We even reached number one on Latin Billboard charts. I signed with Universal. And I'm coming from a garage in my house, you know, like from nothing, <laughs> super humble and uh, universal. And everybody in the team is excited for the Grammy um, voting season, right? Because they're like, Tony, like, you know, this album is so good musically. Like, you better be prepared to just go to Vegas and, you know, get your first nomination on this. Like, don't be surprised if it happens. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, I'm super excited. So we submitted it, right? And so when the Grammy... Um, uh, email comes with the uh, pre-nomination list, which is basically like everybody that submits gets on the pre-nom list, you know, just in the right categories. So you can vote for yourself, find your number. Uh, we, you know, I got it and I was looking for myself, like super excited. I can't believe I'm going to be able to vote for myself. I'm a Grammy voting member for a long time. And I didn't see that album. And I said, am I dreaming? Like, why is it not here? What's going on? And so um, I hit up Universal. Universal was like, man, we don't know what's going on. Like, I have no idea. So I called the, the Academy and um, nobody would reply. And I finally sent an email and I, I couldn't even sleep that night, man. I was like, I don't know what's going on. Like, I was just so confused. And so finally they replied and they said, oh, Tony, sorry. Um, and it was a very simple email. Like, it was like, hello, dear Tony, your album was disqualified. Sorry. And then, dear, that's it, you know, and then the name. And I said, like, what do you mean it was disqualified? Like, hello. And then finally I replied to them, like, what are you talking about? And so I said, yeah, it was uh, after further investigation, your album, like, didn't have um, sufficient uh, Spanish words, you know, <laughs> in the album. <laughs> like, it wasn't Latin enough. You know? It wasn't was Latin like, enough? What? Yeah. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> like, what? what is this, you know? So I asked for like an explanation and that's when actually everything went wrong because when they replied to me, they made a huge error, man. It was probably one of the biggest mistakes that they could make was that they were like, oh yeah, you have like uh, 46% of Spanish, you need 51% and we had somebody count all the words on your album and they carefully reviewed it. And I said, damn, like that is crazy. You know, like what kind of musical committee is this? You know, are we like in poetry class? Like, you know, this is music. Hello. Like what do you mean so i got pissed man and um i remember i did a a protest on facebook and it went, it went viral you know i like because i i kind of protested my story and people started sharing it like crazy and thanks to that is that um uh you know and people started calling me left and right they're like tony like take that video down you're gonna get blacklisted like don't do this yeah. you can't Year. And I said, I don't care about the Grammys, bro. I don't ever want to even be a part of this. I, I mean, I'm going to ask for a refund for all the years I've been paying to be a voting member in this thing. <laughs> That's and then, great. Um, it's crazy because then after that, the, the Grammy, uh, the Latin Grammy president uh, contacted me, bro. 
And I said, wow, like, okay, we're making some progress here. You know, <laughs> it's a protest, you know, you got to like say, you know, that's why you got to talk. You can't stay quiet. Yeah. And yeah. then he contacted me. He's like, Tony, you know, I, 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 I understand what happened. Let me meet with you. Like you tell me where you live and I'll go to wherever you are. So I told him where I live and we went to Starbucks, like really near my house, man. I live in Kendall. I'm not even like in the city, you know? Wow. So we met here and um, he was a super nice guy, man. Um, and he told me, he says, look, unfortunately, like we dropped the ball here. I don't know what happened. Like, this is not my control. This is like the committee, you know, this is, mm -hmm. this is like, you know, I, I'm not, I can't make any rules like this. I'm just running the company in a way, but you know, it, the committee is the committee. And if I do something to help you, then I would have to like fix all the other errors that have happened because a big, you know, in any company, there's going to be errors and, and, and things, but you know what he says, the best thing that could have happened to you is that now everybody has heard your album because of the everybody's fighting for you everybody loves you everybody's like yo the album should have qualified like why isn't it there you know so now everybody in the industry is like talking about you and talking about how great your album is because the musical quality is you can't ignore that you know so he's like take this opportunity and start working on your next album because you can like you know you're gonna make noise man and then mm. yeah man i did my next album i, I kind of took all that negative energy and turned it turned it into positive and then um, that album is Master Me, and uh, I got four nominations, and including Album of the Year, and I won two of them, Producer of the Year and Best Salsa Album, which was crazy. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story, you know? It's, it's, it's almost like if it was fake, you know? It was, like, written. <laughs> um, That's crazy. so yeah. sweet, yeah. man. And, and you yeah. got to, you won't say you got your revenge, but you got what was deserved. And you said something perfectly... There was lessons to be learned in all this. You know, you walked yeah. through a lot with that space. You were angry, you were frustrated, it felt like a dark space. You're like, I put five years of my life into this record and then poof, nothing. I don't get any recognition for it. And then this, minute, this gentleman comes to you and says, but wait a minute, this is actually working in your favor. Everybody yeah. has heard your record. For a split, yeah. You take that negative and all of a sudden, it's the best thing since life. It worked for you, if not against you. It put you everywhere, right? Yeah. No, people started sharing stuff. Like, like I remember, um, I, uh, I was, I was looking at, um, you know, on a stream of a like a Billboard, uh, one of those conference, um, things, and uh, they had like a panel, and somebody in the audience was like, "Yeah, have you heard about what happened with Tony Sukar and the ground?" And then they started talking about it in the middle of a panel, you know. So, like, people were just talking about it because it it, it felt so bizarre, which it really was. So. A lot of times, you know, and I understand it, you know, like the Academy has to have its rules and stuff, but they're not perfect. You know, they're, they're man-made and humans, we make errors. So I feel like that was an error of their part. And but they they they're working on fixing those little, you know, pigeonholes that that um, that can affect at the end of the day that the future of of a person, you know, like mm -hmm. I could have easily like, again, if I didn't have that foundation of my parents of like hard work and all yeah. that. Trust me, bro. I would have, I would have probably quit music, man. I felt so like mm. discouraged, you know. Yeah. I felt like it was such a, because it's not even like they. I can understand if they don't nominate me. That's fine. Right. Like I, hey, you know, if it wasn't good enough or whatever the case may be, it's fine. But to take me, take the right away from mm. participating, yeah. is different. That's kind of mm. like mm. discrimination, you know. It's like you feel like, you know, there's albums that are, that are like midi music you know like mm -hmm. no quality that are competing <laughs> bro you know yeah, that yeah that pass the rules right mm -hmm, and this mm -hmm. is that is so well established you have bruce Sweetie, you have sheila e you have like <laughs> all of these massive music monsters paying tribute to the most iconic figure of music mm. pop culture in the latino <laughs> way which is supposed to be like a latino pride thing to show yeah our music to a different audience to expand mm. our culture it's to be like and then all of a sudden it's just like no nah, no nah. you know it's, you don't even deserve to be here it's like, Yo, what? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so so knowing that how did it feel when this record hit and you got the two grammy nods and it was like not only did you get nominated you won two grammys on this record that had to feel like yeah now you know my name so and so that had to feel kind of good. <laughs> yeah, you know, that was kind of like that. Um, 
you know that 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 meme, the thug life meme moment. You know, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the no way. No way. You know, I was like, glory to God. You know, like that's all him. You know what I mean? like, it's just funny. Like it was great, bro. It, was, it felt so good. Like my publicist was like, oh my god. <laughs> Yo, we went all out in Vegas, man. We went over there oh. all bling bling. Got my suit ready, bro. You, you balled know, out. It was a celebration, man. <laughs> well, man, you know, e even with all this incredible dedication that you put in to the Unity Project, and then another layer of dedication you put into the the next project, uh, is it Mas de Mi? How do you pronounce it? Yeah, Mas de Mi, and it and translates. So, you know, more of all me. that dedication to your music. Uh, an overwhelming uh, dedication. You actually have another dedication that's even bigger than that, and that is your amazing family. That is that beautiful wife of yours. You've just been recently been married. And, yeah. of course, you've got your beautiful baby girl who is just the love of your life right now. Tell me yeah. a little bit about oh, that yeah, dedication. Yeah. No, that is, uh, I mean, again, like um, understanding uh, now the importance more even more the importance of family it, it truly is um the greatest gift of all you know like to to have your own family and to create this book you know it's a story and and living every chapter man and learning along the way and trying to be better every time and learning from my own mistakes and um it it's just it's such a great purpose you know like it, the unity you know the Oh man, it's just awesome. You know, I I can't even des describe um, this the feeling of of um, of being here, um, creating the legacy and and continuing the Sukar legacy, right? Uh, <laughs> it's like so cool. And and my family was already like a mesh of cultures, right? So my dad was born in Peru, but his parents are Lebanese, Mexican, and Spanish. Uh, my my last name is Lebanese, you know, so I have Arabic in my blood, um, and my and then continues, you know. Now my daughter has an Arabic last name, so it's cool. And then uh, my mom is 100% Japanese, right? Tairako is her last name from uh, her family is from Fukushima in in Japan. And then we have my wife that is Cuban, you know, uh, Cuban American. So now my daughter has a little bit of Cuban in her, you know. It's like well, you know, it just keeps going, man. And it's beautiful because that um, that cultural mesh that my dad had with my mom was really special. Mm. I think like it, there's a lot of things that I knew was normal to me. But when my cousins would be around or friends, I'd be like, your family is really cool. You know, <laughs> like, your family is like, <laughs> they got like this vibe because it's kind of like Japanese or Latino and like <laughs> Peruvian and... So now, you know, doing this mesh with her culture, it's a lot of learning. You know, mm. it's a lot of learning, but uh, it's beautiful to be able to mesh and create your own, like, set of um, environment, right? Mm. And your own, mm. like, story and coloring and, you know, you create your canvas, you know, with your own vibe. <laughs> I so love really that. Yeah, create yeah. your own canvas, man. I love it. You've got the yeah, paintbrushes, so, man. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful thing, man. And... um. It's making me a better musician, you know, actually, too, bro. I, I've matured musically. Uh, I'm more uh, sensitive to to the things that we say in music, you know, with the, the, the message that I want to give, um, the purpose, you know, like uh, how I want to just help as well, like mm. kids, especially, and music education, mm. um, the importance of that. Because, um, you know, Man, like music is getting crazy these days, and a lot of times music for product now. It's like everything is so tied into to selling something, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. versus injecting people with love or a message of hope, you know, change stuff mm -hmm. like this. I love it. I love it. I love it. And and as you frame that through your experiences with your family, um, you would the you were growing and expanding your artistry your production now you've been able to reach back and you've got a new project now that brings in some of the most important people of your family 
Your mother is along with you now. Maybe yeah. Sukar has jumped on the bandwagon, and now you guys are singing together. Tell me about the new project that mom, because I hear she is pretty talented as well. Yeah, my mom is is a beast, bro. And actually, it was funny, bro, because today I was on TikTok. You know, I love I love being on TikTok. I think it's a fun <laughs> platform. And uh, somebody put me a comment, and they're like, "Sorry, Tony, but I'm more of a fan of your mom now than you." <laughs> you know, and I was like, "What's going on here?" You know, like, hey. So my mom is, bro. She's such a talented uh, vocalist and singer and artist and. So the way it all happened was that I, you know, after the pan, well, during the pandemic, our band just stopped working in Miami because there was like no gigs, obviously. So, you know, my sister had two kids, and then the third one was coming on the way and she needed my mom's help. So my mom like really retired from singing in a way. Like she just said, you know, my time is done. I, I want to be a grandma and just help your sister out. And that's it. Like she was just, chilling there at, at home being a, a grandma and then i was uh, uh as a coach on the voice so i was doing the, um, the voice peru i was doing a season there and during that season um the producer decided to make a, a big surprise to me on one of the blind auditions so i was like you know i was like turned around on my seat right and then uh, all of a sudden bro the song starts and i hear I, I hear a voice and i heard my mom and i said what what is she is that can it be and then i just boom i press the button and i turn around and my mom is there on stage on the voice you know and i couldn't understand why and what was going on but she killed it bro killed it on the song like and i nice. said like mom what are you doing here you know and they're like <laughs> nice. Surprise, you know and so man um that episode just that segment um, you know, like one minute on TV is very powerful, bro. That whole segment <laughs> lasted about 30 minutes long, like on, on live TV, because <sighs> after that, like we went all, cause I hadn't seen her in such a long time because I was in Peru and, um, we, we had a segment of just connection and, and like my mom was like, you know, saying how proud she was of me. And I was like, how proud I am of her. And like, and then my dad was there too. Mm. And so it was like a mesh of love and crying and like, and it was just crazy, bro. Uh, people were like, uh, people were insane. And um, so that went completely viral. That went completely viral on, on live TV in Peru. And she became an international superstar in that night, bro. Like seriously, like, like she had no social media, zero, zero <laughs> social media. You couldn't find her, dude. That same day I told, I told my brother, I was like, Kenji, you need to open up an IG for my mom right now. She literally got like, 30,000 followers in the middle, like overnight, you know? No. Ridiculous, bro. Ridiculous. <laughs> and so, uh, man, it was crazy. After that happened, La India, which is one of my good friends, um, she's also a Grammy Award winning singer. She's probably the biggest Latin singer after Celia Cruz. You know, she's top, top. Mm -hmm. She called me. She said, Tony, I'm here crying. Like, I just saw the show. Like, that's her, like India right there. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Tony, you know, I got this song that I want to do. And um, I want to sing it with your mom. And I said, what? <laughs> like, my mom has never recorded in her life, you know? Like, she's like, your mom is a badass. I don't care. Get her in the studio. Let's, let's work. Let's do this song. So we go to the studio. We record the song. Bro, it's a super success. Then the, the network hits me up and says, Tony, you know, we want to do a, a, a show. It's called Peru's Got Talent. And I thought they were calling me, like, to, to get me on the show. And I said, look, I don't think I have time because I have a new baby. He's like, no, no, no. We want your mom to be a, a, the judge on the show. And I said, what? Oh, wow. They on? picked you know, your mom. <laughs> she's taking my gigs. She's taking That's my gigs. That's great. <laughs> Yo, so my mom is over there right now as a judge on Peru's Got Talent, bro. Oh, like, on TV, great. you know, every Saturday night, you know, on, on the biggest network on, in Peru. <laughs> And now we're doing, bro, we're doing shows, um, big shows, man. We got a show in the Milano Latin Festival on July 28th, 8,000 people, bro. Like it's the biggest Latin festival. Mark Anthony was just there. And actually, so w this is the crazy part is that the promoter said, Tony, I mean, you could play in the band, but we want to headlight your mom. And I said, <laughs> your mom's a superstar, dude. You, you, no, you no, might as well sit back over, and relax. Over, take over, like, and I was like, Yo, what's going on? So I'm working on an album right now, man. Like I'm working on a full album and I'm actually working on a documentary too. Like it's an album, you know, we wrote incredible songs yeah. for her. 
and we're, we're we're pretty much almost done with it. Um, Goodness. Uh, and then we have uh, a documentary I'm producing because I want to launch it together with a documentary, which is actually about the, the my parents' life, you know. Mm, uh, mm. And I think it's going to be such a motivational and inspirational project because there's so many people out there that feel like their time is up, you know. I mean, sometimes, bro, I meet people that are 22, you know, that are, that graduate college. And they're freaking out and they're like, I'm just too old for the music industry. Like nobody's going to pay attention to me anymore, you know, like and I'm like, what are you saying? You know, and there's people that are 50, that are 40, that are like really like they think that their, their time is up, you know, and this project is to show them that your time is never up. There is no mm. such thing. God decides that, you know, oh, so and good. it's like so good. the destiny, destiny is Bro, it's written already, man. Just yes, live sir. your life now. Live it and make the best of it now and try your best and continue trying your best because mm. you never know when is the moment. Bro, there's people that go their whole entire life, you know, mm. trying to get somewhere. And then in the moment where it's actually going to happen, they just quit and they don't even know it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you just got to keep going. You got to keep I mean? going. And, and luckily, this opportunity that presented to my mom caught her when she was prepared. Why? Because mm. she's always been that Japanese samurai mentality, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm a badass, you know, <laughs> I, I practice. So she told me, it's like, yeah, when they call me to be the show, I practice my ass off, you know? And she recorded, and she, she's, she's a, you know, she's a professional, yeah. you know what I mean? But she just never got the opportunity. Like she was never <sighs> able to get that opportunity. And mm. once the opportunity met, you know, mm. her and doors open for her, she went in there and she shined, man, and she killed it. And and look now, you know, it's crazy, bro. It's crazy. And that's got to bless your heart to be the the conduit that got to shine the light on your mom. Because your mom gave you everything she had to get you there. And now you get yes. to give it back. Yes. And this is why this project is to date. Bro, I'm telling you, man. I'm not, I'm not saying it's because my mom, but man, and musically, bro, like it is like a shocker man like it just sound like i'm I'm mixing everything in dolby bro like oh you know, my gosh all you're going all out you know, i'm i'm going all out bro like it's just <laughs> the string arrangements man like you know hollywood style like salsa hardcore we got some afro peruvian like cultural like getting mm. into the nitty gritty of like the afro peruvian culture the history yeah. you know of the of the slaves the the drums and and how that developed and then doing songs like that doing stuff with like a little bit of even like like latin trap like like camila cabello type you know it's just crazy bro. <laughs> you are going deep on this one bro no no it's wild man the rest the repertoire and we i i, I co-wrote stuff with some amazing incredible uh, award-winning songwriters and and i'm co-producing too with other badass producers because everybody that i talk to uh, about the project wants to be involved you know it's yeah. kind of like that like india moment <laughs> let like, me catch it i just want to be over there when are you doing it i just want to stop by <laughs> you gotta come so by awesome. man you gotta come by and listen to this bro it's so good man it really is like that i'm, I'm gonna I'm, i want to do it with the documentary because i want to give it a context you know i don't want this album to be just like great music i want it to be like great music but this is the story be inspired you know what i mean wow I am going to make a left and almost close this out. I hope you guys have been watching and been enjoying this amazing interview with Mr. Tony Sukar. He is one of the best. And as you can see, as I told him, and I've told him a hundred times, he's not only extremely gifted and talented, but he's just a, a super humble human being. You can see that in how he speaks, how he loves his family, how he loves his, his mom, how he loves his kids. He just wants to give. And that's the thing I think that helps you chase that impossible. It helps you get past certain things that maybe not everybody else can get to because your kindness opens doors for you, man. I've told you that a hundred times before and I know you know I mean it, but you know, your gift makes room for you, but your talent keeps, I mean, your, your kindness keeps the door open. Thank you. Know, you you, can, you can get you, in there, you, but your kindness is going to keep that door open, keep that door open because people are going to be like, that guy's a good dude. People, people will want to do for you because you're kind. You know what I mean? So, be kind, you know, you got to be kind. That's one of the most, uh, I think, important things, virtues that we can have is like, that's just, we got to help each other out, you know, and yes, there shouldn't be any like little wall dividers between us. It's, it's, we have to be like a giant family, you know, like it's, yeah. it's really, it's really beautiful when you can like 
feel a genuine mm -hmm. respect, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and it, it's, I think it's, it's truly um, why I enjoy to work as a team too with my mm -hmm. musicians and my engineers and everybody because I treat everybody like family, you know, and they treat me as if as well. So yeah. we all help each other. It's beautiful, man. It's really beautiful. beautiful. You mentioned that you had to set a IG up account for your mom <laughs> because you're like, we got to get her on social media. You were one of the big proponents of using social media to engage with your fans. Now, I talked to you a little bit before when we came on, and I'm like, I was looking at your IG, looking at your stories, and you post your whole life on Instagram. I'm like, here you are in the, in the, in the bathroom, you're over in the kitchen with your dog, you're laying down, you're waking up. I'm like, this dude is always on social media. How did this giant become part of how you built your fan base and how you've grown your 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 fans out there? Well, you gotta always understand that um, I, in, the industry keeps changing constantly, and the way people consume music is different than what they were before. You know, like back then, you had the traditional media outlets; people would watch more TV. Now, people watch more streaming. You know, same thing with radio. I mean. When do you go inside your car and turn on the radio? I mean, yeah, there's some people that do it, but I think most people now have Spotify streaming services on their phone. Um, how do you discover songs? Um, do you really go to the top 40 charts to check or do you kind of just wander on social media and kind of look for a hashtag, you know? Um, so that's, you know, I realized that early on, man, thank God. Um, and uh, I, I figured out that if I couldn't get a label to to believe in me, I knew that it wasn't the end for me. I, I knew that it was going to be okay. So I, I just used social media to my advantage and it always, you know, helped me. And the Grammys that I've won and everything, at the end of the day, bro, how do people vote for me? How do they know about me? Through social media. I mean, that's how I got like almost a million followers on, on IG now. Uh, I've got over a million on Facebook. And I realized that it's a community, bro. It's not really about the number. You know, there's people that have 26 million. There's people that have 100 million. I don't really care. Like, I know that those people that follow me are people that truly connect with me and my message and my music and, and who I am. Because it's not only about the music. Like, people think like, oh, my God, it's all about the musical level. No, dude. Like, it's about who you are. Yeah, what, what you do, um, uh, how you inspire others, and how genuine you can be. So I always this positive positivity in my social media. I make people laugh, you know, like I love I love to brighten people's days. So um, nothing. I, I, I now understand that the algorithm is so important, man, for the marketing. So you have to be constantly seeing what works, right? Like sometimes back then, IG would be more about pictures, but now IG is completely about video and not about only like any type of video. No, it's all about vertical video, about mm -hmm. immersive experience. Vertical video, yep about using your phone to create the content versus a professional camera. They want to promote more organic content because they want to make it feel more like anybody can do it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with TikTok, you know? And, and bro, like my mom, one of my mom's TikToks got 1.5 million. <laughs> Are views, you kidding you know? me? It's like, what? Like Mom how? is rocking 1.5 million? Yo, she was just vacuuming, bro. Like, and then all of a sudden, she started singing. 1.5 million views, and it translated into like 300,000 streams on Spotify. Ridiculous, oh bro. God. So you know what I mean, like. And, and again, my mom is not there, like you know, um, being not herself. She's being herself, you know. Yeah. And, and it's not about the makeup. It's not about the cars. It's not a, you know. It's like yeah. organic. People are people are dying for that. People are mm. they need it, bro, because they've been sold so much you know for so long mm. and it's all it's always been about the bling and about this now it's not really about that man that's yeah. actually cringe to people now man yeah. you know people look at it and it's like oh so it, it's really dope there's a very big opportunity for producers for artists for people out there to make an incredible career for themselves you know mm. without mm. needing all these bells and whistles man just get yourself a little midi controller get some plugins bro start writing man mm. you know that's that's, that's what it is 
Well, it's been an amazing interview with you. I, I've got one last question. I think you've kind of answered it, but we'll just close it with this one. And, you know, I just want to say again, thank you for just taking an hour out of your day because I know how crazy busy you are. I know you don't <laughs> sleep because you got a new baby and you're up making music in the middle of the night. <laughs> Believe me, I know your life is okay. So for you to take an hour, man, what a blessing. And I hope those that are watching are blessed too. Um, you know, I said that a lot of people, when they get to the level of success that you are, they get that diva attitude like, well, I've already made it, so you know, I don't have to do X, Y, Z. But you're not like that. You're straight up not like that. You just still, if I saw you on the street, you still walk and I say, hey, Tom, you're good. And you would just converse. You're just open and transparent and kind to people. What do you think is the main thing that keeps you so grounded in where you um, are now? Bro, my family, man, the history, bro, you know, like I look at my parents, dude, like the, the example that they've set is that's how I want to be, man. Like, I, I, I wish I could be half of the man that my dad is, bro. Like, he's such a beast, you know, like he's most humble person you can ever meet. Things that he had got had to go through, you know, immigrating from Peru to Miami, you know, like from working at a bank over there to cleaning bathrooms here, you know. Mm -hmm. um that that example is is what i've i it's in it's inside of me it's who i am mm -hmm. there's no there's no success in this world there's no money there's nothing that somebody can give me that will change who i am mm -hmm. you know what i mean there's nothing that i can have the, the biggest mansion in the world with all tesla bro I'll, you know if 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 Elon Musk was to tell me tony i'm going to give you my entire everything is yours you know <laughs> SpaceX, <laughs> I'll be I'll be the same person. I'll be here talking to you. Yo, what's good, bro? You know, like you know, the, you know what I mean. I don't. It's just it's just the way I, I am, bro. I I, mm -hmm. I like to be this way. I, I'm you and my sister, bro. You gotta be my sister. She's like the most party person ever. Like she is all about having fun, bro. Like you know, <laughs> she'll meet you once, bro. I'm gonna give you a big example. My sister's wedding, dude. The person that cuts my grass was invited to her <laughs> wedding. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like everybody was invited to her wedding. Everybody. Doesn't matter who you were, bro. You got invited to the wedding. Like it's just, you know, we're like this. You know what I mean? It's just the way we're programmed. And sometimes we're a little bit too much, like I guess too too much um trust. <laughs> but it, you know, whatever. Like it's just the way we are. So that that's what helps me keep me grounded. It's just the 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 core family family values that we've had and and the culture that we've established you know because it really it's a combination of cultures it's not just like one you know mm. it's just like the combination and and I feel like um I'm happy this way you know like I'm cool yeah wow. well what a blessing it's been to to have your story and to share it with the subscribers today I I hope I get to play this video for a lot more people because I just think it would be so inspiring for someone to just go you can make it. Your impossible may seem kind of crazy, may seem kind of no way. You may have to take about 500 no's, like you took all those no's to get to Michael Jackson's thing. But wow, once you got to the yes, you know, so I'm hoping if someone's hearing that and thinking my yes is, is close, my yes is almost oh, here. Oh, for sure. It's no, no, I, I'm, I'm certain, you know, yeah. that there's a there's a why we're doing this right now there mm -hmm. again. You know, mm -hmm. the right person is going to see it. Mm -hmm. And as long as one person, you know. Yep gets that um and and it helps them reach their dreams bro then our work is done you know yeah, we do it for the one we do it for the one yeah man well man you get back to that baby <laughs> and spend some time yes. with the wife i'm back <laughs> and get some rest and man we thank you for stopping by and chasing the impossible we should do appreciate you <laughs> and thank you brother thank you everyone out there that got to watch today we should do appreciate you taking the time to stop by the program like we said in the beginning, if you if you get a chance, hit the hit the share button, share with someone so that they can be uplifted, encouraged, and inspired by this story. And uh, we just want to make sure that you can reach back, and this this actual episode will be, will be replayed, so you can go back to the same link and replay it again and share it with friends. And we just thank you for being a part of Chasing the Impossible. Have a great night, guys. Take care, and we appreciate you. Bye bye now.